loving God, we are listening. Please speak. Amen. Please sit down. This is the point in New Zealand where you get casual and you try to counter all of this formality we've just done and bring it down and say something to make everybody laugh. Um, But it's Christmas and we don't make a big enough deal sometimes. And I hope that um, you will walk with me on this and allow us to just really celebrate and think about what it is. Um, Christmas is love, and that's what you hear, and, and, and you see all of the commercials running, and you listen to them on the radio and on the television and between the news cycles and the advertisements, and Christmas is all about love. And this baby is about love. The six pound, six pound, eight ounce, wrapped in golden swaddling wrap, God in a bod, is about love. Look, it, it's Christmas night, and the focus is Jesus and not me and my naffing on, so I'm not going to go too far. But I wonder if you ever wondered about that phrase, Christmas is about love. Because we get excited about this vulnerable baby, and people would have no space or time or consideration of God any other time of year will tolerate and allow these songs and these words that lift his name on high to be in their presence, and they'll even find themselves singing it. It was the very end of November, and I had to fly out of Christchurch, and I was there in the domestic lounge where all the prop planes leave, and I was having a coffee. Those of those who go here know that that's a pretty common occurrence for me. And I'm sitting there having this coffee, waiting on it to be called for the flight, And I suddenly noticed all this music was playing and that it was Christmas music. And I began looking around thinking maybe it's a flash mob situation about to happen where they start singing in a public situation. But everybody was singing this Christmas carol. And it wasn't one of these Santa wears jandals at the beach things. It was one of these carols that we would have just sung in here. Christmas is about love. I'll let you in on a little secret. Mary never once called her son Jesus. She didn't. She called him Yahshua. Yahshua. In our vernacular, we would say Joshua. Yahshua is the Hebrew name, which was a common name that literally translates God saves. The Greeks would have called him Isus, and as Latin got a hold of it and Europe developed, Isus became Jesus, spelled with a J with a Y sound to it, which we don't tend to do much in English, and we changed it to Jesus in our vernacular. You see, the, the name is important because... When a baby was born, and still in many cultures is true, their name has meaning and it is proclaiming and saying something. It could be as simple as that timber company there along the motorway between the BP or just north of the Z station there, McVicar, son of the vicar. It could be son of the tailor or whatever. But Jesus was given the name God Saves. the prophet Isaiah, who wrote these passages that are so often quoted out of chapter 7 and 9, his promise that God gives us of the coming Messiah. He gives us these descriptors that talk about the character and the personality in the person of who Messiah, the Savior, the Anointed One would be. In chapter 7, He tells us a different name. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel is another name for Jesus. 
God saves. God is with us. Yahshua, God saves. Emmanuel, God is with us. Matthew and Luke do this great picture of who this Messiah would be and what he would accomplish for us. And Matthew gives us a very clear point where he doesn't want anyone to be confused that Jesus, Yahshua, will save his people from their sins. And the virgin will conceive. And he quotes Isaiah word for word, Emmanuel, and then translates it to the readers 700 years later who may not speak Hebrew. God is with us. John, now, now look, Mark didn't even talk about the birth. Mark was the book writing to the Romans. It'd be like writing to the Yanks today. They're on the move. They're going. And Mark is that, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then. He's telling the story like he's about to get off at the next bus stop, and he's got to tell you the whole thing. And Matthew and Luke weave these genealogies from both directions of his family tree, all the way back, all the way to him. John starts with who this is, who God is. The Word became flesh and literally pitched his tent among us. He came and lived with us in our daily lives. One of the main reasons? Read down there so that we could actually understand who God is, what he's like, his love for us. It screams to us. This is who my God is like. Now, I'm going to jump to a very complex book. It makes some very clear points you need to understand about this. Leviticus. Leviticus. I just picked up a random passage to be honest. Because the whole book is like this. It just, it's like reading, it's like reading the law statutes. It's just one law and requirement after another. But if the priest examines it, and there is no white hair in the spot, and it has no deeper than the skin, but has faded, and it just gives all of these rules. Now, Josiah is our youth pastor. My son goes to Laidlaw and is working with intermediates. And he's laying out a three-year plan that the kids, when they're in the intermediate stage, will get the meta-narrative, the big picture of what this Bible's like, because it's a big book. And he looked and said, basically, Genesis through the era of the judges, the first year, the era of the kings to the captivity and the post-captivity, and then the New Testament in the third year. Pretty good plan, son. Sounds fine. He goes, hey, it's not bad. I can't use all of it. What help? Great question. I had to go with him about it. It's simple. Every single person knows that he said, every single person knows what's hiding inside. Every single person longs to live without shame, without guilt, and with hope. Now, you can hope in a lot of things, but all of those things will let you down, and then you're left wanting Leviticus is a book that shows you if you do it, you're going to carry your sin. Here's how you do it. And he lays out his very local rules. And by the end of the third chapter, much like the last chapter, at the middle, by the way, you know, there's no way. That's the point. In that book, it also lays out the rules of because we sin and mess up. Here's what we have to do. This kind of sin, you sacrifice this. kind of sin, you take that. This kind of sin, you take that. Once a year, high priest goes into the holy, which this kind of is an image of, and offers sacrifice for all of us together. And by the way, he doesn't have to around that because he has to confess sin. The spirit is going to strike him dead and the spirit is going Glad I'm not a high priest. I was talking to another guy who doesn't have faith recently. And I love the conversation because the young guy was trying to wrestle it out. He was being honest. He doesn't have any church pretense that he could be one ounce of grace. He just asked me how to express it. They go, how do you know? How does it sacrifice? How does it cause the sheep and bulls and birds and everything? How does it take care of sin? That's the point. The writer of Hebrews, complex book in the New Testament, trying to explain it to these Hebrews who were so stuck back there in Leviticus about. Jesus coming as the Passover lamb, the whole point of Easter, coming as a human being to be one of us without blemish, to pay for our sins. And he says, look, all those sacrifices repeated year after year, they don't do anything. They just buy us time. It's just an annual reminder. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sins. I know, I'm supposed to inspire you at Christmas. It's coming. A few verses later, 
And it talks about day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, the same sacrifices. But they can never take it away. But when this priest comes and is offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. It's finished. For by one sacrifice, he's made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Back to John. Because of what God accomplished, the sacrifice, that wrath of the Father against sin, not against us, the wrath of God against sin poured out on his own child. I was talking to Mark, the bass player here, and he's also our sound audio engineer expert, and he does it for a living, pretty fortunate. And I want to get this little thingy you can attach, and I can just fling pictures up onto the screen. (laughs) My wife sent me one just before the service, because she and my lads are up in Wellington. And they're laying on each other, playing on their phones, because that's what you do. And, but they're laying on each other. You know, one's there in university, one's here. They haven't seen each other. They can't be with their brother from Seattle. So they don't get to see each other every day. So they're just sitting there. And, and she sends it to me because she knows I'm a bit of a sot. And, and with my lads, there's just like, you know, ask the staff. I just talk about them all the time. I can't imagine as a father pouring out all of the wrath I've ever had just as a human being in my short life onto my children. But the Father poured it out against them, and it finished it. No more shame, no more guilt, no more hang your head, no more hide, no more need some kind of substance so you can survive. No more suck it up and try to go one more day. Enough. Justice. Finished. And God created us for one thing. To have a relationship with Him. And He came as this vulnerable baby. Six pound, eight ounce baby Jesus. Anybody under 40 will know that quote. He came with no favor, no Trump Tower, no Eton education to get into Oxford or Cambridge, no powerful position of family, not even from the right country. A little occupied, forgotten about, pain in the empire's rear end, Palestine. The Christ sacrificial lamb for us. And all of our frailties are solved in that great love. Yahshua, God saves. Emmanuel, God is actually with us. For the Jews, they had not heard one word from God in over 400 years. There's a song called Emmanuel, and it's written by a singer and writer, poet named Chris Tomlin. I just want to read it to you. I'm not going to sing, you know, sound like a cat run over. What hope we hold this starlit night. A king is born in Bethlehem. Our journey long, we seek the light that leads to the hallowed manger ground. What fear we felt in the silent age, 400 years can he be found. But broken by a baby's cry, rejoice in the hallowed manger ground. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God incarnate, here to dwell. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, praise his name, Emmanuel. 
The Son of God here born to bleed, a crown of thorns would pierce his brow, and we beheld his offering, exalted now the King of kings. Praise God for the hallowed manger ground. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God incarnate, here to dwell. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, praise his name. Emmanuel, oh, praise his name. Emmanuel. Loving God, we celebrate you today. It would be awesome if you speak to us and we had some tangible awareness of you speaking to us even tonight. But that's not why we're here. We're here to worship you and give you favor. We're here to mark that you came. You came for us. We're here to celebrate that we have no value that we determine or others bestow upon us. That no title or power or position merits anything. For you are the one who has determined we are of such worth. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, we praise your name. God is with us and God saves.